What's up, Swiss? Yeah. I hope y'all came with some earplugs because I'm about to send something tonight. Can we hear it for the final switch of the year? Yeah. <laughs> Listen, can we just give a shout out to the incredible sermon series your associate pastor, Preston Grace, gave us for the last three weeks? <laughs> All right, I'm about to send it, okay? So I'm going to preach real fast, but real quick with all the energy so that we can get the tribe, so we can have a good time. So if you need some practical application, it's going to be in here a little bit. But I would encourage you, refer to Keep Digging, the series that Preston just preached last week, right? But tonight, my job is to send it. It is to help you feel how God feels about you. It is to get in your heart a shot of adrenaline that makes you want to take every crazy step he's called you to so you can step into the purposes and the call of God on your life. So here's what I need to do real quick. Can everybody clap for me? Let's go. Okay, okay. Now on the count of three, everybody say amen. One, two, three. All right, I'll give you one more. On the count of three, everybody say, come on. One, two, three. Come on. All right, you are now Pentecostal. You're welcome. All right, so I was raised charismatic as a mug, so tonight I'm a yell a lot, and I just encourage you to jump in with me. You know what I'm saying? Throw an amen in there. Say that's a good, a come on, I don't care how you do it, but you are invited to partake in the journey tonight. So the title of my sermon today is The Best is Yet to Come. The Best is Yet to Come. So when I thought about like how we're going to close the switch here out, it is to help you understand that we are not, in fact, slowing down because we are taking a break. We are revving up. That God is just getting started, that the wild stuff that you heard tonight, the numbers you heard tonight, like that is not the end of the game, it's the beginning. Like what God stands ready to do is nuts. In case you're curious with a really rough count, as of right now, our system says there's 234 of y'all in the building. Can we hear for y'all? Listen, y'all like a whole church. That's wild. That's absolutely crazy. So uh, we're just going to jump into what God's got for us. I'm going to read a passage of scripture for you. It's Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. It reads like this. <laughs> Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. You see, the best is yet to come because I believe God's got a beautiful future. Right? Scripture talks about he's created a beautiful reality for us to step into. He's got purposes and callings for us. And what scripture is saying is that we might have a lot of plans, but the Lord's purposes, no, 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 those prevail. And what I need you to understand, like just from the jump, God wins. <laughs> like, like you cannot kill what God wants to do in this, in this world. Like, listen, God is absolutely going to wipe every tear from every eye. He is going to set the captive free. He is going to heal. He is going to bring a new heaven, a new earth. Scripture talks about how Jesus is going to crack that sky open, coming on a horse with King of King, Lord of Lords tatted on his thigh. King of King, Lord of Lords on his thigh. Listen, if y'all know Jesus has a tattoo, he's got tats. So like, you just go find it for yourself. Revelation chapter 19 is what it says. I'll tell you, listen, Jesus is going to do wild things and you are not stopping it. Like God has decided he's going to come for his people. So we cannot kill the plan of God. However, you can't stop God's plan, but you sure can delay it. You can't stop God's plan, but you can delay it. You can delay it. Listen, at the end of this thing, God redeems it. He sets people free, man. It becomes the dream he created for it. The best we can do to get in the way is really just to say, not me. (laughs) Because he's going to love his people. He's going to get to his people. He's going to set people free. You can't stop God's plan, but you can delay it. And there's a moment in scripture where that happens where God's trying to do something, like he's trying to create something beautiful through a person, and they decide that they're going to delay God's plan. It's found in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 13 through 14. It reads like this. Samuel said to Saul, you have been foolish. You have not kept the command that the Lord gave you. It was at this time that the Lord would have permanently established your reign over Israel, but now your reign will not endure. The Lord has found a man after his own heart, And the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people because you have not done what the Lord commanded you. Here's an encouraging thought for you. The encouraging thought is not that you can mess this thing up. The encouraging thought is someone did it before you, which means there are things that God wants to do today that are available for you to pick up. Like I believe in my whole heart that there are dreams, that there are callings, that there are anointings. There are things that God's been trying to get into the world for a while 
and he's just been waiting for someone to be able to take it up. Like I believe that God's got businesses that people have never thought of before that he wants to create. I think there are inventions, innovations that he wants to get through somebody to the world. I believe that God has got songs that have never been written, that he is just trying to get one person to get pen on paper. Listen, I believe there are clothing designers, businesses, all kinds of things. There are an endless number of things that I believe God has been trying to get to earth and all he's been waiting on is one of us to be crazy enough to be like, all right, Jesus, bet me. Like, if you're going to do it, then I'm crazy enough to believe that you do it. One of the reasons why I deeply believe, like, it's not a theory. I know it. And in the deepest part of my heart, that the best is yet to come is because you have a heartbeat. Like, there's breath in your lungs. <laughs> if you've attended here any longer than like two weeks, you have heard one really consistent phrase. And that is that you were created on purpose with a purpose. Like, God was like not low key in heaven, just bored out of his mind. Like, I guess I'll make another one of them. There's not enough of them, so I'll throw another one out there. No, no, no. God was meticulous in the way that he created you. Scripture says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Like there is a God-given purpose inside of you that he wants to get to the world around you. Like you were created on purpose with a purpose. And, and there's this moment in Scripture where it indicates that God is looking for a person to do something. And it's the prophet Isaiah, and he's having a conversation with God in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. It reads like this. Then I heard the voice of the Lord asking, who will I send? Who will go for us? I said, here I am, send me. Here I am, send me. Like God's out here looking for something he's trying to do in Israel. He's looking for someone to just have the faith, to have the courage, like, all right, God, if you're gonna do it, it might as well be me. Right, what I think is happening today is that wasn't just true for Israel, that's true now, like right now in this moment. I think God is looking all over the earth, trying to find one person, just one person to believe that he can do what he said he is. My question for you is who's courageous to say, I got next? Like if you're going to do the thing, why not me? Right? If you're going to create something that's going to change the world, why not me? If you're going to change generations, if you want to create legacies that are going to change the world forever, why not me? If you're going to love a city and reach a city and change a community, why not mine? If you're going to use the church, why not this church? If you're going to move, why not use me? And I think he's asking you who got next. Who wants the next shot? Because what I believe is you were built on purpose of purpose for a specific time. And right now, in real time, you could change the world. 234 of you in this room, you could change a whole city. Like you have enough people in here to swing elections. Like the scope of what God could do in just this room is outrageous. You have everything you need to walk out the plan that God has for you. The best is yet to come. Who got next? Who's going to step in? As we're following that story, what happens is, because God tells Samuel, there's a man after God's own heart. And Samuel's like, all right, I got to go look. So God sends Samuel to the house of Jesse. And when he gets to Jesse, (laughs) what winds up happening is he's like all these sons, there's eight of them. And one after another, after another, they come in. And, and one comes in and Samuel's like, that's him. Like you ever walked in a room and just known like, like he's him. Like what would happen? Like if LeBron walked in, like we would just all know immediately like, oh, okay, we are not on that specimen's level. That is a different, unique human being. Like you ever been somewhere? It's like, if someone gonna change the world, it's clearly that guy because like they got everything or it's clearly her because she can sing, her hair is flawless. She got lashes that don't end. Like she killing it. Like, like that girl is just killing it. Like, like, you all, like we all know, like you probably have someone in your mind. Like if there's a person that got it, it's that one. That's exactly what happens to Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse seven reads like this. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. (laughs) The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. (laughs) Here's what's really frustrating about humanity is God's got all of this that he wants to do. But we are so acutely aware of every reason he can like so many of us are living our life using Samuel's gauge, not God's. Like you're aware that someone in the room is faster than you. You are acutely aware that you are not the smartest person. You are not in your terms, the most beautiful. You are not the the brightest, the quickest. You're not the funniest person. You don't got the dreams. You don't have the leadership chops that everybody else wants to follow. Like, Like you are acutely aware of every reason that God can't use you. Because in your eyes, you don't look like you got everything, right? Like, and we do that with everybody else too. Like we'll look at other people and be like, ah, it ain't him. You know, like, I don't know who got next, but I know it ain't him and I know it ain't me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know that ain't them and it ain't me, but it's like, I don't know who it is, but like, like we are using Samuel's gauge all the time, 
all the time out here trying to decide for ourselves what God can do in us. As if he didn't create the whole thing. As if you got here by accident. As if he did not take time shaping you the exact way that he wanted to get you here so you could have everything he needs to do through. You are aware of all the reasons you think you can. But what I need you to hear today is God doesn't call you gifts. He calls you. God does not call your gifts. He calls you. Listen, you got talents. Go find five minutes with me or any one of your tribe leaders will help you find one. You have gifts. But it was not your gifts that he called. It was you. It was you. Like, like God is interested in you. He's not interested in what you can do for him or how shiny you can get or how smart you are or how much you can grind. No, God just simply wants you to know him. And everything else that's needed for that journey, God is going to come right along and he's going to supply. Like God does not call your gifts. He calls you. <laughs> this moment should not happen. I just shouldn't. Like, like I should not be on this stage and you sure enough should not be in them seats. <laughs> like this don't make sense. Right? Like God does not call a high school dropout. Like I got to not graduate high school. I got no degrees. I got nothing. Now to be clear, please graduate high school. I just didn't like, there's a lot of context, but I do not have a single bougie name or title next to me, right? I'm not the guy you pick. Like if, if we are taking interviews for pastor of small, or of, 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 of a student ministry in town and church, my resume is not making it through the first draft. Like, it's just not there. Like, no, I, I didn't graduate high school. Listen, as far as I can count, I'm four generations deep on addiction. Like four generations of dysfunctional, unhealthy, messy, just broken people, breaking more people, hurt people, hurting people constantly. Like as far as I can count, it's all the way back. Like, I'm not supposed to be here. You're not supposed to have an insecure student pastor with Tourette's clicking the whole time talking to you. Like, this is not who God picks to put on the stage. So you shouldn't be here, right? You should not be in a room with me, with these leaders in this moment, because I am absolutely, if anybody is not qualified to have a mic on their face talking to you about Jesus, it's this guy. But there you are. <laughs> and here I am. If I could only explain to you the mental gymnastics I have to do all week long to just get to this moment, you would understand that if God can use me, I promise you, he can use you. Why? Because he did not call my gifts. He called me and he supplied everything I needed for the journey. <laughs> and like I just well articulated for you, I'm not that special. So if he can do it for me, then he in fact can do it for you. God will give the gifts. You just got to chase his heart. Like it's wild because we make it complicated, but the truth is it's really simple. If you desire Jesus, if you chase Jesus, if you are doing the best, you know how to not perfect, not clean, not killing every day, but just doing the best, you know, how to scripture says you're going to find him in the end and he's going to make up the gap right? Because that's what amazing grace is. That's what the call of God is. It's not how sharp you are, how quick you got there. It's just that even when you couldn't, he lifts you up along the way. God does not need your gifts. He needs your heart. Because what's Proverbs chapter 19, 21 say? It says that many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purposes that prevail. The best is in fact yet to come. But like, now I don't know about y'all, but for me, there's a big tension in there. Right? Because if something is on the way, what does that mean you and I got to do? Wait. Right? Like if the best is yet to come, well, that means it's not here. <laughs> that means like it's there and I'm here. And I don't know about you, but I'm not a very patient dude. So like the whole idea, like, all right, the best is yet to come. I got a call on your life. I'm going to set you a beautiful future. All these things like, all right, bet. Like now though. <laughs> and then like now doesn't happen. And it's like that waiting is a whole time of like, not great, not fun. Like there is a tension in this. And there's this moment that we find out David has to walk through this, right? As, as we catch up the story, what winds up happening is it's David, right? It's King David, David, Goliath, that guy. And Samuel comes in and he anoints David and we see him have to face kind of a crazy reality. And it's first Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. It reads like this. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers and the spirit of the Lord came powerfully on David from that day forward. And then Samuel set out and went to Ramah. He went to Ramah. So like Samuel went to Ramah. Samuel didn't take David to Ramah. Samuel comes in, he's like, 
you got next. In fact, like we know who's next. It's you. Like you got it, dog. Like, like heaven said it's you. Like here's some oil. Let me get you all sticky and crazy and messy looking. Like you are going to be him, bro. If ever there's been a him, it's you. You know what I'm saying? We got you, David. You about to be king. Deuces. Listen, if y'all pour some oil on me and tell me I'm about to be something, you better take me with you. You know what I'm saying? Like, like you done sent it. Like, I'm in now. Like, we done did all that and sh- shenanigans. And like, like I'm, I'm in. Like, I'm about to go with you, right? We go, no, no, no. Actually, David, can you do me a favor and go pick up some more sheep poop? What? David been a shepherd, bro. Like, he just got told he was leveling up. Like, he was on the come up. Hashtag start from the bottom. Now he here. Like, like David was red tea. He was sent. And see, I was like, it's you, but you're going to have to wait. So I'm going to need you to go ahead and go back to doing what you were doing. Can you imagine what that's like? Like to know that you're about to be the next king and still have to walk those same hallways. Still have to have all your old brothers looking at you like, bro, quit playing. Like saying was a missed that. You know that ain't you. Let me, how much you bench? <laughs> Come on with it, Dave. What you got, bro? Like every day out here, shoveling poop, shoveling poop, watching sheep. Like, could you imagine the tension? Here's what's crazy about David's story. Scripture says that when David was king, he was 30 years old. <laughs> which is young. That's cool. But when he got anointed, most theologians think David was somewhere around 16 years old. (laughs) Guys, that is 14 years, 14 years of knowing God said you'd be king and not seeing it. That's 14 years of your reality not looking like the thing God said it would be. That's 14 years of you being acutely aware of all the reasons God can't use you, but still thinking like, maybe God, maybe you could do it. That's 14 years of watching other people get blessed. That's 14 years of other people getting set free. That's 14 years of other people's relationships not ending in dysfunction. What's wrong with me? That's 14 years of watching your brothers go off the war and battle and change the world. 14 years. Like, and some of us can't handle following Jesus if our first prayer requests don't get answered. Like, God, like, like, give me a straight A. But like, I ain't gonna do no homework though. (laughs) But like, you know, God, guide my hand. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna hit C's the whole way through, God. I know you got me covered. And you get that 52 on that test and you all in your feels like, God left me. Like, you didn't wait, bro. You didn't give no God, no time to work through nothing. No, no, David had to sit through the craziest reality of knowing that the prophet of God told him he'd be king, but he couldn't see anything in his life that looked kingly. And what I need you to understand today is that God does not microwave your calling. I mean, it'd be dope if he did. And like, if you find a way to speed your process up, write a book, let me know. I'm going to read it. I'm going to follow you. I would love that. <laughs> but what I've come to realize is that it's a process. That he's not taking you through shortcuts. That there are things in you he's trying to get ready so that when the day comes, when the moment comes, you'll be ready to step into whatever it is. Right? Like it's not a microwave, it's an oven. He is slow cooking everything inside you, and it is frustrating. It sucks. It's not fun. It's irritating to have dreams that still just feel like, for whatever reason, like you ain't fully touched it yet. But Proverbs 19 21 says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purposes that prevail. See, everyone remembers David for killing Goliath, and they should. Like, it's dope. Like, like, listen, if we get to heaven and God's got like a sports center top 10, like, that's the one I'm going to rewind back to. Like, I'm low-key trying to see the little scrawny boy take out a giant with a slingshot. That sounds wild to me. I don't know if that pebble was just like heavy when it hit him or it was like a sniper bullet. Bro. Like, I don't know. I just, I, I just got to see. Like, physics don't suggest that that should happen. That's what I'm trying to take place. And like, we all know David for killing Goliath. And we should. Like, we should. Like, that is, that's wild. There's a moment, though, before the moment that I want to take you to because it speaks to how David got there. <laughs> and it's 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 36. And it reads like this. Your servant has killed lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Now, we can read scripture sometimes, just be you know, blitzing through it. it. Your servant has killed a lion and a bear. I've never killed anything with my bare hands. I, I, I don't plan to. But like I imagine the process of taking a lion out would have you feeling the type of way about you. Like just, you just went to work. You snapped that lion's jaw, like you took it out. Then you just take a lion, you took a bear out. Like, like what was happening is, is while David was doing the mundane, God was doing the miraculous. 
While David was doing the everyday journey, God was working some things out David didn't know he'd need. Listen, while David was out here shoveling sheep poo, a bear came in and David said, no, you're not gonna touch what God said he's mine. I'm gonna take care of what he gave me. And then he had the strength to take the bear out. Then he took the lion out. And what you saw David do is while he was waiting, God was working. <laughs> while he was picking up poop, God was working. And I get it. I, I understand it. Like I, I know how rough it is to want to see God do incredible things and just feel like you're waiting. But while you're waiting, God is doing something. He does not waste time. There are things right now in front of you that God is using to help shape who you are called to be so you can step in to the best that is ahead. The process is needed to fulfill the purpose. <laughs> David was taking out lions and bears so that when God needed him to kill a giant, he'd know he could. And my prayer for Switch is that while you're here, that's what we're doing for you. We are just funneling faith and purpose and hope and giving you tools to grow and develop and to get healthy so that when your giant is up in front of you, you're not thinking you might, you know you will because you know who you follow. Because you spent time chasing his heart and he started cultivating some things in you so that when it was game time, you was ready to shoot your shot. The process is necessary. So David kills Goliath, right? Now it's king time. Nah. What? All of Israel, bro, like they all weak. Like, like they all punked out. Like, just go read it. Like, read the chapter. Go read chapter 24 and back. Like, like they are scary. Like, they don't want none to do with Goliath. Here comes David, takes it out. Like, if ever there was a moment to make somebody king, it's that. But no, that's not how it's for David. Now, at best, David gets to be general. And then when you follow, like, David's life, it's crazy because he just starts going out and he does the amazing. Right? Like they write songs about David, like David killed his 1,000 and, and or, uh, Saul killed his 1,000, David killed his 10,000. And David just starts doing what God's called him to do every day, faithful. And something wild happens as this starts getting rocky. <laughs> you see, because once you decide to chase the plan of God, you will face opposition. Because <laughs> I believe the best is yet to come. I believe that God's got beautiful plans for you, but I'm not going to lie to you and tell you it's going to be in the cakewalk. Like I can actually assure you that if you will actually do the work to try to chase God's heart, you're going to find some turbulence. You're going to find some difficult because you can't grow without some stretch, right? There are just some things that are going to happen. Like when you go to step towards your purpose, man, you got you fighting against you. You got people fighting against you. You got the kingdom of darkness and hell fighting against you. You got some opposition. Scripture says that like, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. Like it's going to get rough, but Jesus didn't say it would be easy, but he did say you'd get stronger. He did say he'd be with you. He did say he walked through. You can walk through fire, but you'll come out that fire not smelling like smoke. Like, like that's what God does in the process. And he's working some things out. And David understood that. There's this moment that we see David and he's on the run with all of his men. And Saul and his men are chasing David. And David's running from the king. And he goes and hides out in a cave. And like, they're trying to chill out, breathe, get their stuff together. And wouldn't you know it, Saul shows up. David's out here chilling in a cave and Saul's got to pee. Swear to you, that's what the Bible says. Like, I'm not making that up. The Bible says Saul had to relieve himself. Like, imagine, like, like you're out here chilling. Here he comes and he don't know you're in there. And there's this moment, like you ever been like talking about somebody, but like you ain't trying to let him hear. He's like, shh, 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 shh. like you shouldn't be doing that. But we all know we did at some point, right? Like, like you'll be here hush talking. Like that's exactly what's happening to David. Like David's sitting here, here's Saul in front of him. And all of his men are talking to David like, now's your moment, bro. Like people don't just be peeing in caves randomly and you be in here. Like if ever there's a time that God is saying, kill the man, this the man. Like Saul's not trying to go give David a wrestle match. No, no, he wants to put a sword through his chest. Like this man is chasing David down to kill him. And here's the guy in front of him. And they're like, don't be no punk, bro. Like you ever been in school? I hope you never get in fights. Please never get in fights. We're trying not to do that. But like, let's be real. We've all seen a fight in our life. Like, like you ever been at school, high school, middle school, and you just see it happening? And there's like one dude and another dude or one lady and another lady. And you got all them yag in the background. Like, I know you ain't gonna let them disrespect you like that. That's your mama, bro. Like, like, like quit playing. Like, like on your mama, bro. Like, don't be doing that. Like, like, we don't even put another mama. I'm on my brothers in the earth. Treat your mama nice. Like, don't be doing her like that. But like, let's be real. Like it'd be happening, right? Like, like you see people like, don't be out here, dog. Like you got to put some respect on your name. Like just gassing you up. Like you ain't even a fighter, but now you feel like I got to bro. Or my people ain't gonna have my back. Like I'm just be out here alone. That's exactly what's happening to David. David does it. He shows up and he's like, I ain't going to kill him, but like, I'm going to cut a piece of his robe off. <laughs> what, bro? 
<laughs> like, if you're going to do it, do it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you shouldn't, but like, <laughs> so David cuts a piece of his robe off and scripture says he gets super convicted. Immediately knows he ain't got no business doing that to the king. And here's what scripture says happens in 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse six. It says, he said to his men, as the Lord is my witness, I would never do such a thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed. I will never lift my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. I, don't, I can't imagine like the maturity it takes to have someone trying to kill you and realize like it's not your job to get in God's way. <laughs> like if he said you'd be king, he's going to make it happen. And I don't know about you, but I do know me. And I do know that I'd be trying to big time force God's hand. I'd be trying to rush the plan. I'd be like, God, I get it. It's a cool plan. But like, you are not working on my calendar. Like, like you was only in hell for three days. Like you got me out here for three years. Quit playing Jesus. You best speed the process up. Like what? No, like, listen, he can do what he wants. And I promise you, you can get to the plan. It's going to be absolutely worth it. And what David understood was like, nah, bro. Like it's not, I can't. Like, I'm not going to get in God's way. Like, as frustrating as it is, as hard as the waiting is, as long as it takes sometimes. Like, no, no, I know that if he said he'd do it, he's going to do it. And then if I'll trust the process, then when I get there, I'll be who God called me to be. And he could trust it because he killed the lion. He had killed the bear and he killed Goliath. Like, he had seen God do what he said he would do. And what I would encourage you today is to trust the process. As frustrating as it is, scripture still tells us what? That the best is yet to come. And here's the thing, like we can make David to sound like he's just this amazing angel, like, right? Like writes beautiful songs, kills giants, real pretty, like just like, like the best of the best. Now this dude was as messy as it gets, like as messy as it gets. Like Saul's a fool. Saul is a messy dude. But what do you think David is? Like when you read David's life, David legitimately gets a lady named Bathsheba, brings her to the court, sleeps with her, gets her pregnant. And instead of just being like, my bad, like processing, his response to that is like, nobody can know. So then he takes her husband, puts him on the front line of army and gets him killed. Like sleeps with another dude's wife, gets her pregnant, kills the husband. That would not be like the sports center top 10 of people. You know what I'm saying? Like, like if God's taking qualifications, it ain't him. Here's what's wild though. It ain't like a one-off. Like David's messy from start to finish. Read the Psalms and you'll see it. Like David at the end of his life, his son Absalom comes in and takes over his whole kingdom. Like how sucky a dad do you gotta be for your son to try to come in and take over your whole shop? Like everything you know, like, like, like actually dad, like I get that's gonna be mine one day, but it'd be cool if you die faster. In fact, I'm gonna speed it up and I'm gonna come take it all. Like it's gonna be mine. Like, like how much did you have to fail for your son to wanna come in and take absolutely everything for you? David is a messy dude. <laughs> but what's so crazy about his story is David would go down and to this day is considered the greatest king of Israel. Like he is a hero to the Jews and he is a hero to us in our faith. Like David is him, but they were both messy, Saul and David. And what's the great difference? In my opinion, the great difference between Saul and David is one was seeking God's heart and the other was trying to manipulate it. While David was not perfect, he trusted who God said he'd be. And while Saul was not perfect, he tried to make God be what he wanted God to be. If we can seek God, what you will find is everything that you need. And no matter how frustrating it is, no matter how difficult it is, what I can tell you is, is that scripture is not lying. David gets to the end of his life with all of the rap sheet that he stacked up, all the L's that he took, and he is considered a man after God's own heart. And that might sound real fancy, kind of poetic to you. There's one person in scripture that gets that title. Not another person has that. Like this messy, broken, hot mess of a person gets to wind up becoming the greatest King Israel had and a man after God's own heart. Why? Because he trusted the Lord. Because he was willing to wait. He was willing to take the steps. Didn't mean he got it right every time. In fact, he got it wrong a lot of the time, but it doesn't change anything. Why? Because God didn't call you gifts. He called you. <laughs> because David was seeking God's heart, he knew that Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21 is true. And that is many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purposes that prevail. Hear me switch. The best is yet to come. The best 
is yet to come. If this has been the best year of your life, the best is yet to come. If this has been the worst year of your life, the best is yet to come. Why? Because the Lord's purposes, they prevail. You cannot stop what God is doing. You can delay it. And here's what's incredible is God is so good that you could have delayed it every moment up to today and he can come in and change it all over again. Because if David could do what he did and be a, God, a man after God's own heart, guess what that means? You and I can be exactly who God called us to be. Yes, absolutely, amen. Go with that, I like that, amen. Listen, here's the thing. If you will seek God's heart, right, if you will, if you'll do the best you know, again, to be clear, you didn't gotta be perfect. You just gotta try, bro. Like, just try. Just take one step in front of you to try to get to know who he is. If you will try your best to trust God's process, if you will just take the next step that is in front of you, then you're going to find out that exactly what David did. And that is that, in fact, the best is yet to come. But my question for you today, as we're wrapping this thing up, is what if the best wasn't just to come for David? And what if it wasn't just true for you? But what if it was true here too? What if today isn't the peak of what God wants to do in Switch? What if today isn't the peak of what God wants to do in this city? What if today wasn't the peak of what God wanted to do in you or inside the school? What if God is just getting started? You see, I don't think the best is to come. I know it is. Because I was here six years ago when there was only 16 of you and there were six of us. And I was messy and I wasn't smart, still really not that smart. And I didn't know what we were gonna do or how we were gonna get anybody to hear. Like how would there ever be a team that would wanna serve with me? Cause I'm a mess. Some of y'all saw me frantic today. Like I'm difficult, I'm choppy. And God was faithful. He did exactly what he said he would do. Like, like we went through COVID and shrunk down and here we are 237 of y'all tonight. Like guys, that is insane. That is a wild number. That's not supposed to happen. Like the best was yet to come. But what's wild is one day where you are is will be there, right? What you're waiting on one day is going to show up. You'll trust the process. What you need today to get there is going to wind up being a moment where you look back and you see it all. And you see the faithfulness of God. And then you see what he can do in a city. And you see what he can do in your life. And you see what you can do when you just try the best you know. You make a lot of mistakes, but you don't stop moving. Switch. It ain't just the best is yet to come. I know it's true because I'm about to drop some wild knowledge on you. Y'all ready for this? Check this out. Like we are just getting started. So here's what's about to happen for you as we step in and we wrap up the sermon. This year, August 17th, it is the third Saturday in the month of August. We are going to do something this church has never done before. We are going to create a leadership conference. And what we are going to do, because we are going to bring in people built by Muskogee from Muskogee who are changing the city. What I tell you that you are created on purpose with a purpose, I'm not just saying it to you. I want to get you in this room and I want to put every ounce of leadership and calling and purpose. I want to get you in rooms you've never been in so you can find out that if they could do it, it's true for you too. I want to look back one day and be out here looking like, man, we used to be like in the top 20 most dangerous cities in the world. And now everyone in the world is flying here because there's a generation of students who decided I got next, who looked at God and said, I'm messy. I ain't got it. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I'm dumb enough to think God that if you can raise from the dead then you show enough can use me, if you can, Use that man with Tourette's on a stage. My story ain't nothing, God. You got me, so that means I got next. <laughs> Listen, I don't know how y'all felt today, but like I'm a 10 0 extrovert and y'all had me feeling the type of way how many bodies were in here. It was bananas. <laughs> so when we come back in September from summer break, we are going to run two Wednesday night experiences on a Wednesday night. <laughs> We are going to tailor make a junior high Wednesday night experience. So that sixth through eighth grade, it is your moment. This is going to be your space. You're going to run like crazy. Just have all the fun, do all the things. And then we're going to take ninth through 12th grade. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to build something for you. Something that gets you in a space where you can continue to invite your friends so that God don't stop at 237, but he gets us to 637. And he gets us to 10,000 and, and 20,000. And, and one day your kids are being raised in a community that is safe, where they are loved and they are cared for. We are not done. We just getting started. Why? Because the best is yet to come. <laughs> but like, 
But like, what if I'm not done though? What if we got one more? Who wants one more? All right. For the first time ever, summer 2025, we doing church camp, y'all. And to be clear, we ain't going nowhere. We doing the daggone thing. You know what I'm saying? We're going to build it our way with our people in our house. Because they ain't like us. You know what I'm saying? We're going to do it our way because that's what God does. That Easter egg song at the beginning wasn't no accident, baby. Because what this church camp going to be is something ain't nobody ever seen before. It's going to create a space that when you get out of your community, you get away with God for five days, you come out breathing fire. You know what I'm saying? You come out knowing, not thinking, God about to change this city. He going to change my life. So summer 2025, it's just a setup, y'all, because we are doing the daggum thing. Listen, I'm, I'm about to pray. But what I want you to understand is that you created this. I mean, I could stand up here and talk words all day long. And we could create tribes for you every Wednesday, but it is your faithfulness. It is you showing up. It is you believing in the house that is helping other people come and encounter a very real Jesus. And so I want to say that as your student pastor, as one of the 50 leaders on this team, man, we are honored by you. It is the honor of a lifetime to stand with you, to believe the best for you, to fight for God with you. And I can promise you, if you will take the steps, if you will be faithful, if you will seek God's heart, then you're going to blink. And one day you're going to realize that the best really was yet to come. Let's pray.